My name is Emily Choi. I'm the concertmaster of the Auburn Symphony Orchestra. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about spring from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Now I've mentioned before that the Four Seasons is a set of four concerti, and a concerto is when you have a solo instrument and orchestra. But what I didn't talk about before was how many he wrote over his lifetime. So Four Seasons, so that's four concerti. In addition to that, he actually wrote another around another 496 of them, because he wrote 500 of these pieces. What was he doing with these? Well, he worked at an orphanage for over 30 years, so he actually had a lot of students who would play his compositions. So that's a fun fact about Vivaldi. And spring in particular is one of his most recognizable pieces of music. I mean, I would say that Four Seasons is probably his most famous piece of music. So, in this concerto, there's a lot of celebration, you know, the long winter is finally over and we start to see signs of life, maybe some green grass and hear some chirping of birds, and ice has melted. So I'll begin just by playing the very opening of this concerto. birds so he writes in a couple of bird songs and he uses three violins to play it now I'm only going to play one so you're going to have to you know look up the full recording to hear all three playing at once he uses a lot of little trills to imitate the bird chirping image that Vivaldi puts into this movement is bubbling brook. So you'll hear sort of the water movements like a little river. Finally, the last big thing that happens in this movement is a thunderstorm and he puts these two ideas against each other with the orchestra playing sort of the thunder part and the solo violin playing the lightning. So I'll play the thunder first. <laughs> Eventually the storm ends and we're back to our festive opening. Alright, next we have the second movement, which is the slower movement of the three. And in this one, Vivaldi writes that he has created a meadow full of flowers and there is a sleeping shepherd and his dog. peaceful and calm movement. And finally, we move to the third movement, where it's back to the festivities. So you, you'll hear that celebration, you'll hear some different musical instruments as well as dancing. musical 
instrument, I mean, what besides the violin is going to be playing? Um, so he puts in something like bagpipes. Have you ever seen bagpipes before or heard them? Something that's unique about the bagpipe is that there's always a drone note that's happening when it's playing. This means that it's basically holding one note the entire time, but then there's something, you know, happening above that, a different melody, some more notes. So he recreates this with the violin. the violin version of bagpipes. And also, there's dancing, that's part of the celebrations, and it's very playful and light. And finally, the whole movement ends with very quiet ending. Well, that's it for spring. Thank you for exploring the music with me. As always, don't forget to check out the full recording on YouTube. There are so many of them. Now let's go back and finish your art project with Monica. Hi, Monica Tolis here. This project is inspired by Vivaldi's Four Seasons. This project in particular is the spring project. In this music, it's springtime, in the music, we hear instruments mimicking the sound of birds. You are imagining fields filled with flowers, um, a goat herder, and his goats. And so for this particular one, I selected a goat as my subject. Now, to simplify things, I printed off a copy of a goat that I just found, just the head of a goat that I found on the internet. Um, if you don't have a printer at home, feel free to use one at your public library. You can, if you have a card, you can um, print for free. Another option for older students is to encourage them again to draw the goat. Um, again, we're looking for shapes. Let me just use my brush here. In this particular example, the head is more of an oval. Inset in that is a circle that is the nose. And then the ears are just kind of these teardrop shapes. So as you draw anything, it's a form. Look for the shapes. Combine those shapes with connecting lines. So. Before we get started, I want to go over real quick the supplies that you'll need. On this project in particular, I'm using watercolor paper. If you don't have watercolor paper, you could use mixed media paper, which works well. Cardstock works pretty good. Just remember that with cardstock, if you use a lot of water on it, as it dries, it's going to kind of get have a ripple to it or a wave that's okay just use whatever you have available the other thing I'm using is a set of watercolor paints um, has eight colors in it of course a paint brush a container with clean water in it plenty of paper towel um, I've got permanent markers and if you don't have permanent markers, you can use just a regular marker, but I'm going to talk about um, when to use those. Regular markers will have to wait till the project is completely dry before you start using them. Permanent markers will start out with the permanent marker. It's water resistant, so we can get paint up close to it, no problem. If 
you ha don't have um, watercolor paints at your disposal, just get some little dishes and use food coloring. Your food coloring has all your primary colors, so just remember if you need an, a secondary color, for example, red and yellow together make orange. Um, what I have here is just a little dish and I've got some red um, food coloring. And again, just add a couple drops and you're good to go. It's uh, a great substitute for watercolor paints. All right, let's get started. What I did was print off my image of my goat and then I cut it out, laid it down on my paper, and very carefully with a pencil outlined the goat. Now, because I'm using permanent marker, I'm going to go through and right now outline, go over those pencil marks with my permanent marker. And, you know, close is good. They don't have to be right on. My goat's ear kind of goes off the edge of my page, again, to help create some visual interest. Like we just caught the goat moving through the field and took a quick picture. Um, next, I'll go ahead and fill in the eyes. And here I want to put some highlights in them, so I'll outline that and just color that in with my marker. We'll do the same on the other eye. And We'll come in here and sketch out the nose and the nostrils. We have this kind of little, almost it looks kind of like it's smiling. And then down here, just a few dots with my marker. Okay. And I think that looks pretty good. So I'm going to stop there and um, move to the watercolors. And in this one, I'm thinking about the music, I'm thinking about the colors of spring, like flowers are beginning to bloom in the field. I'm not gonna use normal colors when I paint this goat. I am gonna focus on the colors of spring and the colors that you might hear in the music when you listen to it, really bright, vibrant colors. So I'll grab my brush here and the technique we're doing is wet on wet. So basically what that means is you'll load your brush up with water by placing it in and just holding it just for a few seconds. And then you're coming over to your picture and you're just carefully laying down some water onto the paper, more water on your brush, and then let's go and pick up a color. And then we just put that color where we previously, previously put the uh, puddle of water. And you just kind of let the watercolor do its own thing. So we want to wipe our brush off, load it up again with some water, and continue working in sections. It doesn't matter where. As you see, I'm avoiding or I'm coming right up to that permanent marker with my just clear water. I'm going back into the water and grabbing a color, loading my brush, and then just kind of touching it and letting the water just kind of flow and do its own thing. Again, before you go back into your water, get the excess water out of your brush. We'll load it up again 
and I'm going to move up here. And you see your colors kind of start to run into one another, which adds to the interest in your, in your picture if these colors start to blend. Because we're using primary colors, you know, yellow and orange, you might, or yellow and red, you might get orange. But don't worry if your colors start to bleed into one another. It's what makes your picture interesting as you go. Again, wiping off the paint before I go into my glass of water and bringing it down here into the nose and the mouth. Wipe it off again because I did get a little bit of yellow in there. Fill it up with water and maybe we'll go into orange this time. Load the color up on my brush and again just kind of let it flow. You can even go back over some of the colors that you've already put down and just kind of let them all blend into one another. Wipe that color off. As you see, my glass of water is still nice and clear and that is because my pigment, I'm wiping it off. I'm being very careful to wipe it off before I go back into the water, load my brush up, cover an area, and if you picked up a little color, wipe it off, load your brush up with water, and actually, I'm gonna go back into my purple Ooh, that was, that was a lot of color on that brush that time. But you know what? I'm not going to worry. I'll wipe it off again. Load my brush up. And I'm going to just run some water. See how that just flows like that? Down into the ear. I gave that dark purple somewhere to go by just flowing some water down there. That looks kind of cool. So let's wipe it off again. All my color is basically ending up on my paper towel, not in my um, little glass here. And I'm going to come over here and kind of do that same thing. Put some water down in the ear. Wipe it off, load it up, and go back into the purple and we'll just see what happens here. Okay. And just move that around. All right, I'm going to keep going here and we'll come back and take a look at it in just a moment. And then I want to talk to you about what you need to do if you don't have a permanent marker, how to use just a regular um, black marker. Okay. So I finished painting my goat here and I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, if you look at this, you'll see maybe over here um, there are areas where uh, I didn't paint, the watercolor didn't spread over in those areas. That is totally okay. Again, it just adds that really cool visual effect to have those areas that um, are left unpainted here and there. Another thing I wanted to point out is over here underneath this eye, I've got a little bit of puddling, meaning too much water. Something you can do is just, and I usually take a paper towel and kind of fold it over itself to give me maybe a little pointed area. You can go in and just dab that area and kind of thin that paint out, or, or excuse me, that water out where it's gotten too watery. There's a little bit down here in the very corner, which is my orange color there, and just dab it and then let it finish drying. So when I started out with this, I was using the black permanent marker. As you see, I got water, I got paint on it, close to it, over it, 
and the permanent marker doesn't um, run or smear. If you don't have a permanent marker, leave your pencil drawing as it is, go in and paint, put down all your watercolors, and once your painting is dry, go back in with um, just a regular marker. But just to let you know, your painting has to be absolutely dry before you use um, a non-permanent black marker on it. So there you have it, my springtime goat. And that's it, and I hope you enjoyed this project. Thanks.